this presentation is about uh, a couple of things. Um, it's about relevance. So the first part is really an open dialogue to say, where are we right now? And I'll use the time it's taken for O3B to get into operation, which is since 2008 as a reference, to what's happened during that period. And try and take a measure or a guess at what are the fundamentals that we need to prepare for for a world of big data over the same period going forward. And hopefully that will pose a few questions for you. How do we compete? What are the boundaries? How do we interact with one, and one another as vendors or satellite operators? How do solutions complement each other? And how fast do we have to refresh in terms of innovation? And the second part is to share an experience or a number of experiences from our existing customers that are live in an, and in operation about how they took our unique capabilities and took that and applied that to a world of big data to find new revenue streams that the satellite industry would never have otherwise have identified. So our chairman is in the audience. He's one of the co-founders co of the company along with Greg Weiler. Uh, interestingly, this is the first time in six years he's actually come to see me work. So, presentation for you, job interview for me, no pressure. Um, but he has told all of us in the company that to understand where you're going as a company, you have to fully appreciate where you've come from and where you are in order to put everything into context. And in terms of where we've come from as a company, we started in 2008. That makes this event very special for me because this is the event in 2008 where we came along with Greg Weiler and we announced this new idea. And reasonably, most people in this room did not believe that we'd ever see the light of day. So having started there just six years ago and got to the point where I can make the real first foundation statement for this presentation is a source of pride. One, I get to tell the story on behalf of 150 very, very dedicated and talented people. And two, because it's, it's, it's a major milestone for the company to say we are open for business. We have over 4.3 gigabits of capacity in action worldwide. We have sold into every single sales region, every product to every vertical, on the eve of the full-scale global launch of our services. But where have we come from? So when I say we, I'm now no longer talking about O3B. I'm talking about us collectively, but we started here in 2008, so let's use that as a reference. Then when we first stood on this stage, we used to talk about the quality of throughput based on download. How fast could you get a file? We used to think about our computers based on the amount of memory. Even if we couldn't fill that memory, it gave us a reference as to the quality of our computer. If we wanted to collaborate with each other, we had to physically walk into a room and share ideas. And in, in the analog sense, that's how we learned. And of course, the way we thought about mobility just six years ago stopped at the laptop. And of course, now, just six years on, it's completely different. We stream, we Spotify, we Netflix. We cloud. We're happy to put our data in the hands of third parties. G Drive, BoxNet. Dropbox. We collaborate now online. We don't need to physically go into the same room, and we learn differently. And we've gone quickly from laptop to tablet to phablet to smartphone to now wearable network devices. Everything's changed. Any idea what these have in common? And these are the applications that shape our daily lives. We are all using these applications in one form or another, week in, week out. Most of them, nearly all of them, never existed just six years ago when O3B first stood on this stage. The world changed right under our feet. Facebook only had 100 million users. The Android phone had not even been released. WhatsApp was created and sold for 16 billion during this period. HTML5 became standardized. Everything changed. So the point of this is to really say, well, let's take stock of how fast the world is moving in such a short period of time, bringing us to where we are right now. And so if we know that, then we know what's going to happen in the future, right? Of course not. 
we're no better informed than we were back then. But there's some fundamentals that we do know. We know that the world is not going to get slower. That our customers are not going to require, they're not going to start asking for less bandwidth. And we absolutely know that in general, nobody will pay any more. I pay the same now for my mobile services. My wallet share is the same for 4G as it was for 3G, for 2G. And in, in the global economy, we're probably looking to pay less, not more. So that's a real challenge for all of us. So the fundamentals that we're looking for is greater interactivity, more bandwidth, and I'm talking about us as an industry, how we keep in check, how we keep in pace, and the challenges that we have ahead of us. So if we look to the future, we can, we can count on a few fundamentals. In just three years, we are going to add one billion internet users to this world. We are going to almost universally use mobile within 10 years or so. We are going to see, in just three years, nearly a billion 4G connections. The number of apps downloaded is going to increase exponentially just in the next three years. And then we get to the real driver for bandwidth. What are we on the cusp of as we go forward? Well, it's, it's the Internet of Things. It's every network device. You don't have to look all the way into the future to try and predict what will happen. You just read last week's newspaper. This just being one example of thousands at this point. The Apple Watch. So in this instance, the tectonic sensor is paired to your partner. If you have a secret code between you, you want to leave the dinner early, you tap three times, and your partner will feel a tapping sensation in exactly the same time synchronized to the tapping on the watch. If you want to hear the other person's pulse, feel the other person's pulse, it will replicate the tap according to the pulse on the other person's wrist. It's a network device. Is it me or is nothing sacred? I mean, the thought of somebody listening to my pulse as I walk around is just horrific, but there you go. And in a similar way, and I'm just using Apple as one example because it's recent news, but they've opened up CarPlay to nine manufacturers and third-party applications such as Spotify. So now we're talking about very, very soon cars and so on and so forth becoming network devices. And beyond that, the scale in which network devices are going to challenge our bandwidth, our transport infrastructure, be it C, KU, KA, GEO, MEO, or LEO, is phenomenal. How phenomenal? Well, there are more network devices today in the world than there are people. Even the most conservative estimates say that within seven years there will be 20 billion network devices. Some say as much as 50 billion. It's a lot. We know that consumer electronics takes the lion's share of all of those network devices, and we know that particularly, speaking for O3B, in emerging markets, the sum of all of that far outweighs even the so-called developed world. So this is what we're looking ahead to. So now we look at the fundamentals. What are we all preparing for? Well, we're, pre we're preparing for a fight to stay relevant. So. Where I would say there's an analogy is, is if you look at the 1970s in the UK, right? If you think about what our role is. You see, nobody in this room is going to develop any of the applications that will be on the next page in five years' time when I give this presentation. And it's not because you can't see into the future, and it's not because you, develop, you don't develop apps. I'm talking about you as an age group, including myself, with Generation X. The millennials created all those applications I mentioned before. And why? Because they have a different set of values. They collaborate, they share information, they solve new problems, and they have no problem whatsoever with collaborating to find a new product. Whereas our generation really didn't do that. And so they're creating something new. That's why the CEOs of all these applications are from the millennials. They're from Generation Y. So what's our role? here in this room. Our role is to prepare the transport infrastructure for the future. 
in the same way as in the 1970s in the UK when cars became mass market and affordable, we built motorways. And look what happens if you get it wrong. Just go from the M25 to Luton and you'll realize exactly what I'm saying. The roads weren't wide enough, they weren't durable enough, they didn't last long enough, and they weren't future-proofed. And in the same way, we have to create bandwidths and highways that will support the applications of the future. So now, just having thrown that out there, what I would like to do is to just talk about where we play our role, and our role is really about data. It's about big data. It's about big highways that are highly interactive with low latency. But what happens now that we're live and we're open for business, what are our customers actually doing with that capacity? The first point is, what we've learned over the years is we really compete with no one. There is not a single customer on our books that you can talk to directly that will tell you they have retired any of their geo capacity. In fact, more than half will tell you that to keep geo relevant to the bandwidths that we're providing, because geo has a fantastic role to play, in some cases they're actually increasing the bandwidth. The Pacifics is a great example. So that which raises the question about the battle of the bands. It's nonsense. It's how we coexist, it's how we sell consultatively to our customers, not to confuse them and to make them understand where they can apply different technologies to the best use cases. I want to start with Maritime. We're phenomenally proud of what we've done with Royal Caribbean, where the six largest vessels in the world, three at sea today, are all supported by uh, our steerable beams. We talked to Royal Caribbean a number of years ago, and they basically have a number of challenges. They want to make sure that um, users that go offshore have exactly the same experience as onshore, not just now, but five years' time. So thinking about big data, thinking about network devices. They want the experience, the wow factor, to be shared in the moment. They want their friends and families to understand the quality of the service provided by Royal Caribbean to increase their bookings, increase their interest, drive their business. And they want the staff that support this amazing infrastructure to be content with the bandwidth they provide. They're away from home and they need connectivity, so welfare services. Greg Martin from Royal Caribbean will present tomorrow, so he'll go into this in much more detail. The video I'm going to show you now is the launch of O3B on the quantum vessel. Uh, which is their latest vessel, uh, which will sail out of New York early in November. Uh, hopefully, this will blow your mind. Introducing Quantum of the Seas, the most technologically advanced ship ever to sail. Quantum amps up the guest experience for both the tech savvy and non tech savvy alike golfers and gamers, grandmas and geeks. This isn't just a ship, it's a smart ship. How smart? Six ways to Sunday smart. Six ways that will blow you away and blow alternative forms of vacation travel out of the water. The days of getting away from it all on a vacation are long gone. Guests expect to be connected to their social networks, their media, their jobs, to each other. And that's what you get with Quantum of the Seas Smart Connect capabilities. Quantum of the Seas operates with unprecedented bandwidth using satellites launched with tech partner O3B Networks. These satellites do not send out a broad signal, but beam directly to the ship. Revolutionary, as is the bandwidth provided. How much bandwidth? More bandwidth than every other cruise ship in the world combined. Wow! Letting you upload photographs to Facebook and videos to YouTube. Tweet. Skype, stream movies, connect with friends and family on board anywhere. Even play Xbox Live with gamers worldwide. This isn't just an upgrade, it's a quantum leap. Super smart. Quantum changes everything. Fabulous, and you can imagine how proud we are. What I find interesting about this project is every band is on that vessel, sold independently by operators and integrators. So there is no battle of the bands. I can tell you C, KU, and KA are independently doing their jobs to support very specific roles and working in concert. But the interesting part is not by the design of the satellite industry, but by the know-how of the customer. So 
for the first time in this industry, as I see it, as we're going into this wave of new competition, the question is how do you compete? We should never compete against our orbital positions. We should never really compete too hard about our assets, which is Spectrum. We should never confuse the customer. But what are we missing in by not presenting joint consolidated solutions? Because you will end up in a situation where customers miss the point. And Royal Caribbean, I checked just uh, an hour ago, have not retired any of their capacity on the vessel. So this is entirely new, and we're proud of it because we're becoming part of the satellite industry and we're becoming a flagship for a new type of service. In trunking, um, Timor Telecom is a great example in East Timor. There are three operators. One has fiber, which is Telcom Cell, coming in from Indonesia. The other two oper operators were on geosynchronous services. And both um, Telemor, which is part of the Viatel group, and Timor Telecom are, were lagging behind significantly in the deployment of 3G services. So we spoke to them and we explained about uh, how they can differentiate uh, a, a, and de deploy 3G services ahead of Telemore. And we also had to go and prove that we could beat fiber as the competition. They were contemplating a fiber route from Darwin to Dili in East Timor. So we, this is now the satellite industry competing directly against submarine fiber. And we convinced them. So that's capacities that the satellite industry would never normally see. Again, we're competing with no one in this room. So we're increasing value for the satellite, and as a result, they've been able now very aggressively to go and market a number of these internet packages. And here's how they market their service as a result of O3B. <laughs>Um, I checked this morning, they were pulling 580 megabits into the country. Live 3G traffic. The, the, the satellite solution from O3B, the MEO satellite solution from O3B, is comparable uh, and it's competitive against um, the submarine cable solution from Telcom Cell. Latency, definitely latency. Um, because latency allows us to, to provide more services and allow us for each application to increase their throughput. So we have a network um, downstream to, 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 to O3B of 3G networks that can allow access to 21 megabit per second per user. But with a geostationary sa satellite, we cannot achieve that, that, uh, that capacity. Uh, so O3B allows us to increase the throughput per user which allow a better quality of experience on, on the internet. <laughs> it's so, so much better uh, and allow us to do so much, so much more from the internet after the O3B uh, has, has um, put in place that um, it's almost hard now to understand that we could live with the internet w uh, as a service was, was before. And interestingly, what happened was, is as they deployed 3G, they, the, the access network became the bottleneck and they had to upgrade. But what they did with the existing geo capacity is they then moved that to 2G sites further into the edge of the network. So they pushed that out, and of course, over the course of time, those sites will become 3G, and the process repeats itself. So again, the customer is actually bringing the technologies together to work in concert, but the operators are not. They're two independent operators. Very quickly now, moving through, uh, going to mobile. Um, we talk to MNOs all over the world because of the previous slide, right? 80% of the users in, within 10 years will be using mobile full stop, and it's probably more like 90, 95% in our markets. But they all have a similar set of challenges, which is largely about coverage, capacity, quality of experience of the services, trying to run over-the-top applications or, app or public applications across the network, 
and not being able to get the session throughput they need. But more importantly, when they add 3G services, they only get somewhere between 16 and 20% incremental revenue. The bandwidth is increasing by 5x. So what's interesting there is, even though expressed as a per megabit price, we, we are quote unquote cheaper, actually the customers invest more in net dollars with O3B than they ever did before, and, and it's in addition to what they already had. This is Digicel Samoa, live right now. Just launched the Be Exceptional service. Share tradition. Share the culture. Share the journey. The joy. Share the memories, the moments. Share the adventure. Share information. And technology. Share the extraordinary with Digicel. The extraordinary. Yesterday in their peak hours, they were pulling down 197 megabits of forward traffic at an average latency of 142 milliseconds. And over the, over the last seven days, that's run uninterrupted as it has done for months with zero packet loss. So they're obviously delighted. O3B is a new Digicel Pacific partner, and so far Digicel Samoa and O3B are developing a very good business plan and providing a bandwidth gateway to link and put Samoa on the global networking map. For now, we are connected on O3B, and uh, we are doing this conversation over the Skype, and you can see that it is reliable in terms of uh, quality. There is no drops, there is no latency, and it's very clear. The, uh, the customers are experiencing a difference. Uh, there is definitely, there is a case in low latency, high data speed and a quality in providing the data. Uh, the customer satisfaction is really something that uh, we are very happy with O3B. Uh, what services O3B is providing us, what quality of services providing us is actually impacting very well into our business. And lastly, in enterprise, Enterprise is different to, to the operator domain because they don't live and die on the, on the price of bandwidth. And in fact, the savings that they make by moving middleware into the enterprise is essentially um, turns the price of bandwidth into a rounding error versus the gains that they make. And uh, when we talk to particularly the, the oil and gas sector in exploration and production, we find that they have uh, a number of challenges. And right now, we're focusing on the top five uh, producers, many of whom have already tested our links. When they talk to us, they're telling us a number of things. One is that they have a requirement for bringing back lots of seismic data in, in the terabytes a day, which we're, we're helping to develop a solution for. The other is that they actually want to bring back all traffic from production and, and platforms. There's just no means to do it today. So they selectively pick the most important parts from the sensors and bring that back to a grid computer. The reason they want to bring back all of the data and they're so hungry for bandwidth is called predictive computing. So they effectively will see three or four sensors or whatever, whatever number of sensors and the, in real time, the machine on land, grid computer, supercomputer will crunch that data and then machine to machine send instructions, either shutting down a well, taking a precautionary measure, sending out alarms, so on and so forth. And it takes real computing power to take all of the sensor information, and it takes real bandwidth to transport that. They also want to deploy middleware to become more operationally efficient. Um, things like ERP, for example, cannot be supported, and this is an Oracle standard, without having less than 400 milliseconds. Uh, other cloud-based applications, desktop virtualization, which just allows them to take IT managers off platforms, such as VMware. So by putting in our capacity, they're able to create new opportunities for new middleware, but I can tell you, existing satellite infrastructure will stay there. 
for sure. And that's because of the mission critical nature of what they provide. And we're happy with that. We'll probably provide about 80 to 85% of the bandwidth needs, but the critical component remains. So again, another example of enterprise customers thinking very smartly about what's available and bringing the technologies together, but the industry really not doing anything about that to promote it themselves. This is an independent test result from one of the top three oil producers in the world where at a leading integrators facility where fiber was provided, we brought along our link, GeoVSAT came along with acceleration, they created their own independent test report, throwing as much at the link as they possibly could, and a number of other middleware applications which are too long to list on here. And it shows you why they lean to using O3B for big data. We're targeting the top five uh, oil producers uh, initially. I can tell you that we're under contract with two of the top five. We're trialing with a third, and we'll be in, co in contract with another one before the end of the year. We are extremely relevant to the enterprise sector, the energy sector, in relation to what they need to do in their network that they couldn't otherwise do today. And we're well supported by five of the leading signed system integrators in this space. So, the takeaway message is this. One, as I said, we are open for business. We're real, we're live, we have satisfied customers. Two, we're in this together. Personally speaking, I'm a little tired of the battle of the bands, the, provo the, the provoking and the argument to try and get us to contest with each other, often in full view of customers, as to whether one band is better than another. In the terrestrial world, there's, there's obviously severe competition between one box provider and another, but there are limits. There's a way to compete smartly, which is to go sometimes together and com provide combined solutions, whether it be different orbits, whether it be different frequencies, because the truth of the matter is, as I've shown you, all of the customers are smartly using all of the technologies and none of what we do reduces any of the revenues for geo operators in particular. So why not? And lastly, thank you for listening. Very good. John, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Um, any questions? You first. Can we have a mic, and would you like to say, please, who you are and uh, who you work for? Uh, Nadim Khoury, High Cap Telecom, Hi. Saudi Arabia. Uh, I just wanted to know the, the impact of, of course, this is really, you are offering an excellent service, but you need a more sophisticated space, ground segment. You need more than one antenna, you need uh, full motion or whatever, uh, auto track systems. How does this impact your business? And did you have any real problems with customers on that? Since, of course, it's, it's totally different from having a fixed dish uh, where you will never worry about, uh, you know, the performance. Yeah. Thank you. So, to be, to be fair, there are cases where the real estate can be a challenge. So, for, so right now, given the cost of our infrastructure, and you're, you're right, we have two antennas, it's still uh, surprisingly low given the amount of infrastructure that we, we deploy on a terminal. The reality is, is that what we do in almost all cases is trunk. Royal Caribbean is trunk, but we designed a system where the beam tracks the vessel. Uh, the mobile backhaul applications we have, they're also trunk, but we focus on the middle mile. So what we do is rather than try and pick up the, the, the traffic at the very edge, at the, at the tower, consume lots of real estate, increase the amount of capex, we partner with microwave solutions. We find a transmission high site, we drop 10 or so microwave links, or rather our customers do, and they aggregate 10 times 8 megabits of traffic, and we pick up the 80 in the middle and we bring it back. So yes, it's backhaul, but really the application is trunk. And that seems to be the pattern that's emerging across the board. Obviously, trunk is trunk. You know, through the Pacifics, we're doing some links that are up as high as a gigabit. Um, but so far, for the ground infrastructure that we have, 
we tend to focus on the application of trunk to different verticals. As we expand the system, and keep in mind that we have another four satellites that are going up at the end of this year or, or January time frame, and we keep adding more and more satellites as we are doing, as the satellites get closer and closer together, it opens up a new paradigm for O3B. It can be phased array, it can be Chi-Meta, it can be a number of technologies where um, the, the tracking requirements are reduced because the satellites are closer together, and we are we believe we're moving forward towards a point in time where we can have a single antenna without any moving parts. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but we have a plan to get there. We're continuing to innovate, and I think it won't be too long before we're able to announce that. Thank you. You all, there were several hands. Stefan, you're a consultant. It, it's a point of detail, maybe, but um, you've mentioned that you've signed up two of the top five oil companies now, the customers that O3B had announced lately were more like Norfolk Telecom and Timor, which are eminently estimable customers, but not quite on the scale of what you were trying to build up. But those oil companies you had not announced, and you cannot tell us the name, apparently. They don't want to be known as O3B users, or is this still trials, or are those small deals, or... Or am I reading too much in that? No, the, the advantage is, and I, I can't go into any detail on, on the energy sector, but I can tell you the advantages that they are creating for themselves, particularly in the land-based applications, are so great with what they're doing with our links that they want to retain the competitive advantage for as long as possible. And so they're reluctant to come out and make big statements about what, what they're doing with our capacity because the benefits of keeping that private far outweigh the benefits we get in, in answering the question with, with, with names, right? And that's just, I think within, um, within six months, we'll start to announce those names for sure. What is Otribi's backlog today? We're a private company. Next. Could we just have the mic, please? Uh, gentleman at the back, we're just gonna keep you fit, Caroline. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rasheket Orange Business Services. You have a direct sales model and indirect sales model, or only indirect or only direct? It depends. So <clears throat> what's driven our behavior in terms of the sales model, especially through the construction phase, is the fact that we're trying to move beyond the early adopters into the early majority big flagship reference customers uh, and potential prospects such as yourselves that um, where we need to work directly with them to sell our wares, to demonstrate what we're capable of, to share our plans as a company. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to create a groundswell of opinion. We're not particularly different to other satellite operators, which is the end game is to be as efficient as possible to scale as fast as we can, and for that we will need partners. So in the energy sector, for example, we absolutely, in almost all cases, must use partners. We, we work exclusively with partners. With the two uh, oil companies that I mentioned, we are working with partners to deliver the network. With Royal Caribbean, for example, we work with Harris Caprock to deliver the network. Um, but there are examples, for, for instance, in the Pacifics where we are the leader for bandwidth, and that includes fiber through the Pacifics. Um, we have 15 countries, of which more than half are in operation today. We're adding more or less one every, every few weeks in terms of link activations. And there really, there really isn't a justification for a channel. There's a justification for integra integration and care, but Quite honestly, I don't think that we're at a point where we can justify giving away large margins for huge links that generate significant revenues when the work and the contribution is so low. So honestly, there's, there's, there possibly needs to be a reapproach from some satellite service providers as to how to work with O3B. We continue to talk to them. But there is some um, friendly competition going on for big trunks between ourselves and satellite service providers. One more question. Several hands went up. No? No? Yes. Last question. Last question. Uh, John. I don't oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know this is a gun turret, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I know this, uh, this is probably a very inappropriate question, so you'll be pleased about that. Um, is it appropriate? Do you, you know, O3B was formed with the vision and all that kind of stuff, and you have brought a MEO system to, to market for which you, you deserve, um, you and the founders deserve kudos. Absolutely. You are beginning to deliver service. It's not exactly the way you expected it to be, but you're evolving with, with the market, as you say. Do you have a vision for the, for the future growth? I understand you're growing, going to grow the O3B constellation, and there are many advantages to that. But there is, is there an O3B2? Is the, you, you, we've had talk about low Earth orbit systems and all this kind of stuff, high bandwidth stuff. <laughs> is, is that something you can see in, in O3B's future? Uh, well, look, the, when we're ready to announce those types of plans on that level, we will. What I can say as a truth is we, as a company, and with the board that we have, will never stop innovating. Today, we are hatching new ideas, evaluating new technologies, be it ground, be it space. And for sure, there will be more iterations of, of what we offer to come. And new designs, ground or space, is, is a definite possibility. I would say the assets of the company that really count is the sheer amount of spectrum that we have and the right to use that pretty much anywhere in a medium Earth, a medium Earth orbit, not just on an equatorial plane, but even elliptical if we wanted to. So we have lots of options to explore. Um, right now, honestly, our number one focus is to deliver the best customer service that we can. We're still a relatively small company. There's only 150 so of us, and we've got lots of customers, and so everybody's feeling the pressure and the heat of not letting people down, given that, candidly, a number of customers had to wait, had to wait for longer than, than even we expected. So that's the number one focus, but, yep, yeah, it wouldn't be surprising if in the not-too-distant future you hear of new plans. Thank you. John, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.